Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Timmons. I'm your host for this evening, and uh, I'm really excited about the opportunity to discuss what I think is uh, both a very unique and extremely valuable technology relative to the world of glaucoma and glaucoma diagnosis, and that is the use of ultrasonic biomicroscopy. Um, as you most likely know, uh, ultrasound has been part of the overall picture of clinical care for some time, and as a result of that, uh, everybody has become comfortable with the actual mechanics of what ultrasonography is. So without a great deal of discussion, it's simply a way to gain access to tissue and uh, anatomic information that is unavailable uh, through other sources. It's used extensively in medicine, you know, obstetrics, cardiology, neurology, optometry. Uh, we all have become very comfortable with the idea that ultrasound is a valuable tool. What UBM does is it changes the concept of ultrasonography relative to the nature of the, of the device, one, and the means by which it accesses the uh, tissue. So if you look, uh, the, the key points are really, you know, the lower resolution ultrasounds are less clear, or the lower frequency ultrasounds are less clear. Uh, they do get a little better depth, but when you increase the frequency to certain levels, specifically you know, between that 50 and 100 millihertz range, you begin to tune the device to the tissue that you want to analyze. And that smaller pattern gives you great resolution, as you'll see from some of the images that we have here from cases that have been uh, uh, donated. And then also the, uh, the wavelength attenuation really reduces uh, <clears throat> the penetration, but if it's picked at the right level, it achieves all of the tissue that we want to see. So let's go ahead and do that. So what is UBM? Uh, UBM is ultrasonic biomicroscopy above 20 millihertz, and it really varies a little bit as to where specifically I'm going to talk about this device, which is the Avisa. Uh, the, the ideal tool for imaging behind the iris is clearly an ultrasound. You know, I've had one for several years now, and we use it on a daily basis. Today we used it three or four times. And in each circumstance, it was able to give me information I just could not acquire through other processes because it penetrates through opaque media. It also gives me the uh, opportunity to analyze the tissue in a dynamic state as opposed to a static state, which is what we see with other instrumentation. So previously, we had instruments like the Visante, which was an inter-segment biometry system. And the problem with it was relatively simple. It was almost impossible to view the ciliary body because OCTs, regardless of you know, what manufacturers may want to import cannot penetrate past the iris. The nature of the, of the system that they've chosen to image that anterior segment really limits it to the cornea and anterior iris plane. And you'll see here in a few minutes, that limit is extended when you're trying to calculate the presence of the, uh, or the uh, angular, at uh, the angle anatomy. So in a perfect world, why do we want ultrasound? Well, it's non-invasive. We do it in the office you know, four, five, six, seven times a day. And patients routinely accept this procedure without any issues whatsoever. So it's very simple, it's easy to use, and it gives me tremendous information relative to what other instrumentation can provide. You know, if you look at these two images here, you know, the bottom one is the ultrasound. You can see the depth and the quality of the tissue assessment. Now you have the ciliary body, you have the anterior lens capsule. You have the insertion of the scleral spur, which is not visible in the superior picture, which is a high-density ultrasound. And for that reason, you cannot really assess the angle unless you understand the position of the scleral spur. This is just an anatomic um, slide, you know, sort of a character slide of the anatomy of the eye, and everybody knows this well. But the key here is to is to look at what the UBM gives us versus other diagnostic systems 
and understand that in some instances, and we had one today, you can actually image the aura serrata quite nicely with this device, depending on the you know the view uh, position of the patient. And today we're able to actually view a small tear at the base of the aura serrata in the superior plane, which was really difficult to see with BIO and exceptionally difficult to see with a three mirror. So uh, the device has many applications beyond just the simple uses in glaucoma. The method of managing this has changed so dramatically over the last five years as a result of Quantel's quantum leap, excuse the the uh, alliteration um, and the double use there, but it is a quantum leap, not in the technology itself. We've had UBM for quite a while. The difference is UBM today is just so easy to do compared to where we were before. Before you had a water bath and it took probably 20 to 30 minutes to set the patient up and complete the test on one eye, and then you had to transfer. And for the most part, this was a university center uh, type of uh, assessment, simply because at the end of the day, it was incredibly expensive and it was complex. And for the general practitioner, as all of us are, this didn't fit into a busy clinical practice where we needed information now, and we were able to obtain that information in a reasonable period of invested time for either ourselves or our technicians. I mean, one of the beauties of this test in my office, and I'm sure in anybody's office that chooses to you know, to use it in this fashion, is uh, we trained the technicians uh, in the office, and particularly one of my head techs, who's Josh, and Josh is a master of this technology and is able to effectively do the entire procedure. And I'll either walk in the room when he's there and watch it you know, on the screen live and ask him to portray various elements of the anatomy. I want to see something at 3 o'clock or want to see you know, the cyst that I think is there at, at 7 o'clock. Or he can put the <clears throat> system into a video loop. So each of the analyses that he makes are looped, and I'll just run the loop after he's out of the room and the patient's there with me, and we'll walk through the process with the patient. And I can actually click onto individual screens, freeze them, take a look at them, and exit out and continue on, and then f keep those for print for the medical record later. So you know, the, the ease of access is just so much better. The whole test now takes front to back no more than 10 minutes, and sometimes as little as five or six, depending on you know how long it takes for the patient to get prepped. <clears throat> I do use a little bit of anesthesia prior to the procedure. I don't think it's required. Um, and a little bit of BSS or some form of artificial tear, I think that's actually more important. We've done many of these procedures with no anesthesia, even though it comes in direct contact with the cornea, because the, the really ultra-thin membrane that is the anterior element of the probe is so comfortable that you can place it on the eye, and the patient really has no significant sensation. This is the probe, this is a 50 hertz probe, and one of the reasons this particular frequency was chosen is that it provides the type of depth that we want for anterior segment work. It gets, as I said, back to the anterior or serrata, which is an incredible view of a really difficult piece of tissue to access as far as any other form of uh, assessment. It also has a 16 millimeter width, which gives you an, almost an entire globe simultaneously, so you're, you're able to bundle together some tremendous information in short uh, acquisition times, and this is really quite critical in building the case either for or against a clinical diagnosis. This is what linear UBM provides. It gives you this exquisite view of the anterior segment. And I want to make a comment before we get into any of the other uh, discussion, and that is that one of the questions that always comes up is, well, what about gonioscopy? I can see the anterior segment with that. And I can certainly see the angle, and I would cert I never would argue against gonioscopy. As a matter of fact, it's conjunctive. Every time I do a UBM, I also do a gonioscopy, or conversely, I do a gonioscopy to get a UBM. But the issue is the moment you turn that light on with the gonioscope, you markedly alter the anatomy. And you know, we've had the luxury of doing you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gonioscopies with UBMs over the last year or so. And <clears throat> you'll watch in the room you'll take a look at the angle, you'll make an assessment, you think it might be a grade one, that there's you know, uh, scleral spur showing or there's trabecular meshwork, and then you turn the lights off, put the UBM into play, and in a dark room, after the patient's dark adapted for a few minutes, you'll see that the angle is actually closed in two-thirds of the angle, and this accounts for the patient's problems or presentation. So it's been a very helpful instrument to truly define the anatomy of the angle, which will show you some excellent clinical uh, uh, cases here coming up, 
and more importantly, it's 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 not a replacement for current technology. Instead, it becomes markedly additive to the level that my partner uh, and I use it routinely on a daily basis to define clinical structures that we had looked at before with other systems, but this gives us a defined or completed answer, whereas the others were simply suggestive. So. Uh, this is the probe, and it's basically how it works. The probe itself is oh, about the size of a small microphone, handheld microphone. The actual system is about the size of an iPad, a little bit smaller than that, and weighs probably about as much. So it is a remarkably uh, portable, I use it at multiple offices, uh, system, and it is incredibly simple to use as far as uh, setting the system up, creating the uh, preparation of the patient, and then actually providing the test. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about that process. So this is the actual clear scan uh, probe with the uh, soft membrane at the tip. That green element that you see there couples with the probe itself after it's been filled with distilled water. And <clears throat> you create just enough presence of distilled water to create a firm but not hard membrane, and that membrane completely conforms to the ocular surface when it's placed directly on the cornea. And you do get a, a really outstanding view that is dynamic and allows you to look at any portion of the angle that you want and subsequently analyze tissue specific to location. So a uh, great, great leap in the technology portion, actually the delivery of the technology. And I think that's why this device has become such a popular tool in ophthalmic practices is it's simple and it's uh, something that the patients find absolutely acceptable. So let's talk about some of the clinical applications. You know, we have within the world of glaucoma a number of remarkable opportunities, but I think the biggest issue is that it's, it's important to understand where this instrument fits in the global pantheon of glaucoma diagnoses. It's very clear that glaucoma is, in most of our practices, uh, we've been taught, and I think we've sort of self-directed our energies towards open-angle disease. And in my practice, that's a not insubstantial part of the process. <clears throat> that said, if you look at the <clears throat> classifications of the glaucomas that are listed here, you'll note that a substantial portion of them involve either ankle closure or some form of childhood glaucoma, which is almost exclusively juvenile or pediatric is almost exclusively an anatomic abnormality disease. So being able to image it in a very accurate way is essential to the diagnosis. The open angles are, as you can see here, primary open angle. You have PDS. You have pseudoexfoliation. Um, what's interesting is this device really nicely shows things like traumatic angle recession in a way that gonioscopy sometimes can't demonstrate because this gives you the depth of the damage down as it cleaves the ciliary body away from the scleral uh, framework. So I think globally this is a device that helps define a substantial portion of the disease state. And if you look at the more recent studies out of China, and we're going to go over a couple of these in a few minutes, but uh, if you look at some of the recent studies out of China and the Asian uh, patient base and certainly the Los Angeles Latino Eye Study, it's very clear that narrow angle disease is not a small portion of glaucoma outside of the immediacy of the Caucasian population base that lives predominantly in the North American space, but in fact can be upwards of over half of the total glaucomas and really constitutes a significant portion of any large glaucoma practice. In my office, we just did some calculations for a clinical study that uh, we've been accepted to, and we had to do a distribution by both race, sex, and age uh, of our glaucoma patients, and, and it is 32% Latina and 16% Asian. So 48% of my practice right now is constituted by those two populations, of which well over 50% are narrow angle disease. And so if you're dealing with patients who are Latina, uh, of Latina heritage, or you're dealing with individuals who are from the Asian uh, population base, either Japanese or Chinese or Korean, it's very, it's very obvious that this device plays a major role in diagnosis. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about some of the literature that supports what I just premised. The first thing is sort of reviewing the angle anatomy. You know, if you look, uh, it's very hard to 
see the angle clearly, and as we know with gonioscopy, the ability to define what you see can sometimes be a little bit troubling. Um, I would venture to say that everybody has the two bottom slides pretty clearly. You can see trabecular meshwork that's pigmented, and below that you can see a defined scleral spur uh, on the left side. On the right lower, docu uh, right lower, it's upside down, which is one of the ways you're going to see it. And you'll note that I don't really see a scleral spur below the pigmented trabeculum. That angle is much more narrow than it might appear to be. And on the top one, it looks like it may be open. It might not be open. And in fact, that angle has appositional touch. So you can see that the ability to define by gonioscopy is, is really driven by both clinical skills of the examiner, one, and number two, the actual dynamics that the light brightness plays. I really try hard to delimit the amount of light on gonioscopy to get a be the best view possible and not compromise it in a major way by turning the light up really bright. But you know, in some patients, that bright light makes it a lot easier to see. The problem is you're not seeing true anatomy. Now, what you can get from gonioscopy here is that this patient has pigmentary deposition, and that plays a role in the overall IOP issues. But it's, not, it's a little less clear at the lower right and the upper one as to actually what it is the defined angle um, level is. If you're going to do gonioscopy, and I certainly recommend it, I cannot endorse it enough. It's one of the tools that we use in the practice every day. Um, it's best to have an indentation system for glaucoma. There's a number of different systems out there. Volk has a, a really nice system, which I like quite a bit. Um, and that said, I think you know either the handheld Posner, I have a Zeiss system from the old days, which I love, uh, the Sussman, which is the individual lens over there on the left, and then you have the three mirror lenses. Those are flatter than K. Those are steeper than K, so they're really not the best. You want an indentation system versus that traditional three mirror to be able to give you <clears throat> this view. This is why gonioscopy is important. Uh, I can see this with the UBM, and I can certainly see it with the gonio lens. That left photo is effectively at positional touch, maybe even synechial. The reason indentation gonioscopy is effective in defining disease is you can see that little peak synechia at 12 o'clock and then immediately to the right of that at about 1 o'clock and another one at about 2.30. Those little peak synechia automatically tell you this patient's had previous angle closure episodes and is a really important candidate for relatively immediate and significant intervention as opposed to just medical management in the office. Okay, there we go. Now, if you look at the incidence of narrow angle disease, I've put out some papers and articles that I think are relatively pertinent. Uh, Quigley and Broman uh, probably did the largest body of work outside the U.S. where they looked at the Asian population base, and they found that, in, fascinatingly, in, in the world, not just Asian, but South Asian, Korean, in the world, angle closure glaucoma is the leading, leading cause of blindness. Open angle glaucoma nowhere, is nowhere near it in incidence rate, or visual impact. Thomas, in his 2003 study, showed that 22% of all the patients who have narrow angle glaucoma progress to angle closure glaucoma if left untreated surgically or subsequently untreated and then subsequent to that a, a failed treatment or treated and then a failed treatment. 28% progress to chronic angle closure in five to 10 years if undiagnosed and untreated. And sometimes it's very hard, as I said, with a gonio lens to, to see the difference. You know, Nolan's work in 2003 showed that if you treat an eye prophylactically with a PI, it really is effective in holding the progression of the angular creep that takes place with progressive narrow angle glaucoma. And then fourth, Bob Rich and his group showed that in patients who are misdiagnosed, you can put as many openings as you want in the periphery, but if that patient has a plateau iris, the only way to treat it is with an iridoplasty, and it is effective in deepening the angle, unlike falsely developed information and application that we frequently see with just gonioscopy. So uh, the UBM adds such a, an elegant comment to the, to the anatomic state that patients really do benefit significantly on a clinical level. Um, this is just a, a nice study. This is by Campo uh, and uh, his group, and uh, he looked at the four ways that you can actually analyze the angle. And he 
referenced a number of other studies. You can see Cognon and Tomnus and Albrecht in the von Herrick test. And the von Herrick test almost always overestimates the depth of the angle. So it says that the angle looks different than it actually is, and I, I think we all would agree with that. It, it's a quick screener, but by no means defines the process. Gonioscopy, which we've discussed extensively, really plays a significant role in the ability of the clinician to look at pigmentation, exfoliation, uh, blood, uh, angle recession, um, you know, a, a variety of, of issues. You can look at some of the stents that my partner and I use in, in our clinical practice to treat glaucoma during a surgical intervention. But the reality is it is in no way the defining aspect for uh, angle anatomy because it shines a light. And every time you shine the light, it changes the face of the iris. The pupil goes from four millimeters to two millimeters. Well, the only thing that can happen when you do that is that it opens the angle. And what's funny is when I, when I first made this analogy, it, it sort of just clicked one day, and I thought, oh, that's a pretty good analogy, so I'll, I'll give it to you. When we do an iridoplasty, which is taking the iris and taking an argon laser and heating the iris about three millimeters off the pupil margin circularly, so you put in about 15, 16 burn sites, those burn sites shrink the iris towards the pupil. They pull it out of the angle and they open it up. The exact same thing happens when we put a bright light on the eye. So we're basically doing an iridoplasty with the light and artificially altering the angle structure uh, and then subsequently changing the diagnosis and the management in sometimes very negative uh, scenarios. Uh, UBM, uh, there's no question. I mean, you have Marcini's work. Goto and Ishikawa, all three of them show that the ability of this device is somewhere in the 94 to 98% range as far as defining the necessary structures to produce an endpoint diagnosis, which is accurate, and then subsequently the ability to uh, take that and use it as a tool for clinical um, intervention. And then finally, high-resolution anterior segment OCT or high-density uh, HD OCT. You know, this would be Cirrus, OptiView, and Spectralis. Remarkable instruments. You know, if you look at them from a purely clinical perspective, when they all came out, and they came out relatively equally, it was a year or two separate, but it's been quite a while now, uh, Carmine Poliofito effectively invented the OCT. He's a retina specialist. He invented it to define retina. As it turned out, the companies, within a reasonable period of time, realized that there was a lot of information being collected about the back of the eye, and we could then translate some of that to the optic nerve to look at glaucoma, which is where most of us probably tend to use those instruments. That evolution took about five years, has done a great job, and now we have really sophisticated programs, you know, glaucoma progression analysis systems for um, optic nerve registered, uh, registered optic nerve assessments. With, uh, with the instruments, the ability to measure macular change over time, fantastic. The third piece of their puzzle was that they decided that they, they were passing through the cornea and the anterior segment, so why not take an image? And for the longest time, quite bluntly, it was sort of the forgotten child, it was the stepchild of, uh, of the OCT world. Recently, there's been some effort, especially by OptiView, to improve that to a better level, and I do agree. I think the OptiView system is very nice. I love what their cornea work does. Uh, it, has a, it has a pachymetry map, it, it registers corneal thickness, it registers depth of scars, just a variety of good things. But all of them suffer the same indignity, which is they cannot penetrate past the iris. And as a result of that, if you look at the work <coughs> that was done by a couple of different authors, um, you know, especially Sakata, it shows very clearly that there's about a 25% failure rate, maybe even a little bit higher, and the ability to define the scleral spur and therefore then inability to define the angle anatomy. So while the device looks good on paper, it has some real limits. And as clinicians, you're sort of stuck with the idea that if you use it all the time, you're wrong 25 to 30% of the time in your assessment. And it, additionally, it does stimulate a pupillary response because you're working in um, a lighted situation, even though it's a infrared source, there is light in the area. So. Um, Let's look at some of the clinical slides. This is a glaucoma exam, lights off. This angle was open on gonioscopy with a bright light. Everyone can see that if you look where the actual angle is positioned, which is at the base of the iris and the scleral spur, you can see sitting over there, 
uh, it's clear that this is occluded. So this angle is at positional touch. Now, once you've seen this, you know that the angle is closed in dim illumination. You should go in with a Ganeo lens and see whether that closure is due to synechial adhesions or whether it's just due to phacomorphic pressure or pressure from phacomorphic disease, I should say, <coughs> that causes a bowing forward of the iris structure. In either case, this is an angle that needs attended to. It needs a PI. This is not a plateau iris. And a PI will successfully manage the risk that this patient has until such time as the cataract surgery is required. Here's another version of phacomorphic. You know, this eye looks relatively open. But on UBM, you can see that this, the lens has very nicely begun to shallow the anterior chamber. This is not a deep chamber. If you do an axial measurement from top to bottom, which you can on the instrument, you can actually caliper those down, you'll find that this is not a 3.1 or a 3.2 anterior chamber depth. This is going to be much more in the range of about a 2.4, 2.5. patient probably is a little hyperopic globally. And you can see that the iris root and the posterior, or excuse me, the, the distal iris anterior, uh, face is starting to occlude the angle. And it's not going to take very long before that actually starts to touch. And once it touches, then we've progressed into a state where the patient becomes at risk. This patient actually would warrant a, a, a PI in my assessment right now if they had any symptoms or if there was any family history. So next patient, very clearly, again, a phacomorphic. This patient has a very bulky ciliary body. And you can see that it's, it's basically shut down the peripheral angle, and that peripheral closure is notable. Once again, gonioscopy, bright light, this angle is open. Uh, with this particular view, you get to see the true picture. Now, this is also interesting because I would almost guarantee that this is not closed in all three, uh, all four zones. This is probably, <coughs> this looks like it has some ability to be open in another zone, which the UBM defines very nicely and gives you graphic presentations of all four quadrants. As I said, I referenced my tech Josh earlier. When Josh does a procedure for him, we have a standard protocol. We do the 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. And then if I have any particular areas, we go to those afterwards. He records all four of them. If I'm in the room with him, I watch them. If I'm not in the room, he records them, and I'll go in and watch the video clip. And then posterior or antecedent or, or posterior to that, uh, I will go ahead and have him run specific images at a, at a clock position. If I have a sneakia that I would like to take a look at, I'll have him do that. And it really is helpful to be able to go either back and analyze with time as opposed to doing real-time analysis or, and or the ability to analyze specifically to tissue and concerns that you register from either slit lamp or gonioscopy findings. So this is a convex iris in a pupillary block. Uh, this patient has a classic bowed iris. The central chamber is not that shallow yet. The moment this occludes, central chamber is going to deepen. But look at the space between the anterior capsule and the posterior iris pigmented layer. You've doubled, almost tripled the space from the previous view of the other patient. And this tells you that this iris is, is relatively bowed and that convexity is going to cause problems. You know, you see an eye like this, this is an eye that clearly is going to benefit from doing a PI. You know, put some polycarpine in, get the pupil stretched out nice and tight, put an opening. Uh, usually in our practice, we use the 3 or the 9 o'clock position uh, simply because of the complication that frequently attends with an 11 or 1 o'clock um, iridotomy. And if, if you're not familiar with that literature, basically just in a short explanation, the 3 and 9 o'clock position never have visual complications of second images or diplopia but the 11 and 1 do because the tear prism at the, top, at the base of the top lid frequently acts as a prism and throws the light from straight ahead up through the pupillary opening, in, inciting a second image. So about three years ago, we quit doing 1s and uh, 11 o'clocks. So we moved down to 3 and 9, and since then we've never had a complaint uh, regarding uh, visual imagery post-PI, which used to be a problem. So this is a convex iris with a complete block. So that patient has completely closed out. The previous one was on way to closure. Now you can see that there's a rido, uh corneal contact of about 2 millimeters. This is a deep block. The patient's pressure is going to be quite high, probably in the 30s or 40s. They're headed towards total closure, whereas uh, all of us know you end up with acute angle closure. The chamber begins to narrow pretty precipitously after time. So this is a... Before look, you can see the angle position. 
And the beauty of the device is it measures efficacy as well. Not only does it give you the initial diagnosis and a clear path towards treatment, you also obtain a remarkable uh, output as far as the end point of this, which is the ability to demonstrate efficacy once treatment's been instituted. You can see the angle has now opened remarkably. The patient has resolved the problem, and you can use the device over time to continue to, do, continue to assess on a yearly basis. All right, so here's an, iris, here's an eye with a plateau iris. There's a couple ways to look at plateau irises. Uh, sometimes there's a rotated ciliary body that will sort of shut that down a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go to the next one. This is lights off, and then this is lights on. Okay, so you can see what happens. In the plateau iris syndrome, the reason patients create, the reason IOP issues are created is exactly what you see here. The plateau iris classically looks like this with a gonio lens, and I'm going to tell you that, as I said, I do a lot of gonioscopy, many a day, uh, easily into the 15 or 20 a week, and I've been doing it for a very long time, and I think I'm reasonably talented at it. I'm not fabulous. I'm, I'm good. But this is a very hard diagnosis, even for somebody with a lot of experience. The patient's moving, the light's bright, they're tearing, they really don't want to have the test done. The UBM clearly, distinctly, and simply defines the disease state. And so my partner and I have found it invaluable in separating out this type of presentation from a patient with angle closure. So if you look at um, things like glaucoma filtering, yeah, we, we do a an extraordinary number of um, minimally invasive glaucoma procedures or surgeries, MIGS, uh, stents, canaloplasties, uh, eye stents, express shunts, those types of things. And the ability to image them in real time after surgery to understand conjunctival fibrosis patterns, to see what's going on relative to the pressure that you have in the chair versus the patient in front of you. Gonioscopy is an inarticulate measure of those terms. The UBM defines that exquisitely, and I use them on a routine basis for my post-op assessments when patients' pressures vary, are we either too low or too high, and the UBM is a great tool for defining the anatomy that is critical to understanding the uh, patient's presentation. So some other clinical applications. We'll, we'll move through these pretty quickly and finish in about 10 minutes or so. But. Uh, one of the things I love is the ability of this device to define intraocular lens problems in my post-op cataract patients. So a patient comes in uh, not too long ago, several weeks. They walked into the office after about six months and said, you know, Doc, I've just had this really tender eye since the surgery. And every time I touch it right here, and they put their finger on the right eye right at about 9 o'clock, okay, um, and I – mimicked it, put my finger there, and they ouched back on me. And I dilated the patient, and I just couldn't get a view out into the, into the uh, capsule, capsular bag in the way that I wanted. So what I did was I did the UBM, and I saw that that particular patient had the, the right side of the lens had gotten into the sulcus, which was rubbing up into the ciliary body and producing this ciliary body-itis or a little bit of low-grade iritis. It just wasn't going to go away. And as a result of that, that, that lens ended up getting explanted. The patient's problems completely resolved. We did an anterior chamber lens, and they're doing great. So the, the unit itself was definitive in helping me craft a treatment plan. And I, I had no ability to make that diagnosis without having the additional information that comes from UBM. Uh, the next is a ciliary body cyst, and if, if you've ever worked with patients of this type, these are so challenging sometimes because, quite frankly, uh, they can do what you see here. They can easily narrow the angle. They can mimic what appears to be some form of angle closure, but it tends to be very sectoral. You may have a one or two o'clock hours of closure for these patients. And you're looking at it, and you see that it's elevated. You want to make sure it's not anything other than a cyst. But, you know, the old technology of using a gonio lens, dilating the patient, transilluminating the sclera, and seeing if you can actually define the process, honestly, colleagues, that's just really hard. <laughs> it, it is not an easy process at all. And for the most part, it's pretty inarticulate. Traditional ultrasound is completely non-applied here. And high-density anterior segments imaging with the OCT is useless. 
your only tool to define this is a ultrasonic biomicroscopy. I used to have to send these patients all the way to Manhattan to the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary to a colleague of mine, Jeff Liebman, and uh, Bob, colleagues of mine, Jeff Liebman and Bob Rich, because they had the only house unit on the, in, in the metro New York area. And it was definitive. Send them in, they tend to report back. Now I can do that in my office in less than four minutes. The patient stays in Connecticut, and I can define it just as well as they do. So as a result of that, I am absolutely delighted to be able to have this available for issues beyond glaucoma, of which this is one of them. This is an intraocular lens abnormality. You can see that the uh, lens is positioned irregularly. It's got a shift to the left, and that is one's in the bag and one's in the haptic. The haptic's in the bag, the other one's outside, and it's rubbing on the ciliary body, as I told you earlier. This is actually a very good example of that. So let's talk a little bit about tumors, cysts, melanomas, and we'll sort of finish up the discussion here as we go forward. Um, there's no question that this is a picture that doesn't really need a lot of description. This is an absolute gorgeous image of an iris cyst. It clearly defines that this is not a melanoma. It clearly defines that the angle closure is due to a structural abnormality behind the iris, and that treating this patient with a PI is not going to do anything to result in a, in a solution to this. There has to be other ways to deal with the pressure. Without that, gonioscopy is not going to give you this. This is one where gonioscopy doesn't help you at all because you cannot see these types of changes with anything other than a UBM. In this next slide, you can see that the patient has a iris mass. Now, we do these scans for retinal uh, tumors all the time. You know, a patient comes in, they have a choroidal nevus, it's elevated, you want to see if there's anterior and posterior extension, you do a OCT, which by the way, the OCT is a great instrument for posterior segment imaging of those types of changes. But it completely lacks on the anterior segment side because the OCT imaging doesn't give you the reflective patterns that we really need to define it. I mean, if you go to any good oncologist, retinal oncologist or ocular oncologist, the thing that's going to define the tumor initially as to whether it's benign or not is the, is the ultrasound. And the UBM gives you that same complexity of imaging quality on the anterior segment side and really is the perfect match. And if you go to any practice that does oncology work, they have both of these. There's, there's, they're, not, they're not interchangeable. They're completely complementary. So this gives you a, a great hand up in making diagnoses that were impossible before. Uh, here's a ciliary body melanoma that is absolutely striking. This is almost impossible to see because you can see the angle looks open. There's not, not a whole lot going on. In this case, though, the patient's pressure was abnormal because the ciliary body melanoma had started to activate a change in production of aqueous fluid. So you can see that this is just such an exquisite image. And more importantly, once the patient's treated, you can go back and use this as a mechanism to look for efficacy of intervention. So let's talk a little bit about the device. This is the new compact touch system, which is just, in my mind, remarkable. Uh, it's, it's the same UBM technology that's present in the more uh, complex system that has both a B and an A scan. This is a UBM scan uh, device, simply put, and it weighs, I don't know, I think we can ask one of the one of the company people, but my guess is this weighs a couple of pounds at the most. It's completely portable. What we do is we have screens at each location, which allows us to uh, simply inter interface the device, and uh, we can carry it with us from office to office, which makes it great. Uh, there we go. So the UBM is, in my mind, a great instrument for a lot of different reasons. You've looked at the clinical applications. We understand that the anatomy of the anterior chamber is, is crucial in making a qualitative and quantitative diagnosis of the glaucomas. And there are so many patients who have mixed mechanism, which is a combination of both narrow and open angle disease, that it really sort of speaks for itself as a tool for all of us to use as a, uh, as a defining mechanism for diagnosis and treatment. We also know that things like pupillary block, intraocular lens issues, iris tumors, and melanomas are considerably more common than you would like to think. And I think most of us tend to just move those out of the office because we don't have the ability to define them. I'm sure many of you remember the day before we had OCTs that almost everything involving the retina left the practice. 
today with an OCT, you've effectively neutralized a lot of the advantage that the subspecialists have because you can make the diagnosis and then decide which patients need to leave and which can be monitored in-house. Okay, so this is the end of the program, and it is, uh, it's been a pleasure talking about what I think is one of the great new technologies in ophthalmic practice. So as a result of that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. I know it's uh, getting a little bit late. We figured we'd probably finish about now. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, otherwise, uh, I will turn the program back to uh, our host, and uh, they can go ahead and uh, finish us out. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, this is Levi Hall. I'm the marketing director for Quantel Medical, the manufacturer of the UBM technology that Dr. Timmons just presented. Um, of course, we'll give it a minute here to see if there's any questions that we can answer for you. Well, let me let me offer this. I know that so many many people want to think about. Uh, I'm sure something will come up for you um, at some point, driving into work tomorrow or wherever you uh, practice at. Uh, I'll just give you my email address. It's really simple. It's my name, Jim, T H I M O N S at gmail.com. If you have any questions or if you have any issues that you'd like to uh, follow back with, please feel free to give me a call, and uh, I'm more than happy to or to, just drop me an email. I'm more than happy to respond. As I said, we have an instrument, we have a unit in the house, and we've been using it for some time, and uh, we've been absolutely delighted with it. But I'm happy to share those experiences on a more personal level with uh, that is uh, of assistance to you. So, otherwise, thank uh, um, for my end. Thank you so much, and I'll give it back to you, Levi. Okay, great. Um, there are a few questions here. Um, sure. The first one is um, regarding billing. Uh, speak about billing, please. Um, Probably one of the things that you're looking for is what kind of reimbursement code this is billed under, and it's 76153 if you want to look that up. And um, we do have some information that we can send to you post this webinar, uh, but the national average for Medicare reimbursement is around $100 per eye. Yeah, I, and I, I can confirm that. You know, we track these numbers pretty carefully, and we're at, we're slightly higher than that, Levi. Uh, mm -hmm. We're at about 107, I think, for our Medicare carrier, but others have told me they're a little bit lower. So I'd say average of about 100 is a very real number, and that is per eye. So you're looking at just under $200 on average uh, for the for the uh, test, and that's not exclusionary to gonioscopy on the same day. Uh, you typically don't bill anterior segment high density OCT and UBM simultaneously or consecutively on the same day. One of them will get negated, and you certainly don't have. There's really not a lot of need for the anterior segment if you're billing for, if you're looking at it with the UBM. But the gonioscopy can be billed uh, consecutively same day, and Medicare actually covers that, and we've had no problems with that because those are two complementary pieces of information as we've discussed tonight. So. Yep. Great. Um, there's also a few questions here regarding the cost of the machine. As um, D Dr. Timmons um, mentioned, we actually have two different platforms that UBM is available on. The photo that he showed of the Compact Touch is a standalone UBM system, and the list price on that in the U.S. is $21,000. We also have the Aviso platform, which is an expandable platform that you can add A and B scan modes to, and depending on how you configure it, it will range between 30 and about $60,000 um, U.S. pricing. You know, uh, just a comment about the, the cost of the system relative to, you know, I'm sure a lot of docs are thinking about, you know, can I get this, is this system going to make itself you know, valuable to me from a clinical side? And I think the discussion tonight certainly shows that there's value. Next question is, can I actually make sure that I, you know, generate revenue for the practice out of this? And uh, Corcoran Consulting, Kevin Corcoran is a good friend of mine. He and I have lectured together a couple times on this issue and other issues. He has a general rule, which I find really helpful. I'll pass it on to you because I use it in my office all the time. 
if you buy a piece of equipment and you look at the numbers relative to the reimbursement and the cost, so in this case it's about $200 per test and it's about $21,000. If you can subsume that debt, either directly or indirectly, within two years, it's a good purchase. If it's two to three years, it's a considered purchase. If it's more than three years, it's a little bit past uh, reasonable. A device like this, if you did four a month, one a week, at the end of a year, two years, you know, actually that's 50. Yeah, you're looking you know, just at about a two-year purchase. Even if you did four a month, it was only one a week, you easily make that two-year mark with this unit. If you did two or three a week, you extinguish it within a year and make it actually quite valuable purchase for the practice. So uh, given that, I think the, the mechanics of the billing relative to the information achieved, uh, the ease of application, make this a very attractive option. And certainly that's one of the reasons that we bought it. So. Great. There's two, um, there's a clinical question in here. Can we test glaucoma suspects with family history, elevated IOP, or thin cornea? Well, that's a great question. You know, the use of this instrument is primarily, primarily directed towards the uh, patient with uh, angles that are suspicious. If you see a patient that has an increased intraocular pressure, and you do a von Herrick and the angle is in any way narrow, this becomes a, a very reasonable application. If, on the other hand, you take a look and the angle is wide open, um, it's unless there's angle recession involved, history of angle recession, it's less clear that this is a device that would be appropriately utilized. As I mentioned in the beginning, sort of the sort of early beginning of the lecture, the, the big piece here for me that shifted me was the nature of the incidence rate of narrow angle disease, both suspects and eventual narrow angle patients, in two of the populations that I serve at a very high level. And certainly if you have any significant population base in the Latino world and in any of the Asian populations, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, uh, especially if you're on either the coast, that constitutes uh, in many practices a big portion of today's primary eye care. So this device meets that population head on and addresses issues that you can't solve otherwise. So uh, that would be where I think it's going to have most application. A thin cornea, probably not. Uh, family history, depending on the nature of the family history, yes, if the patient had a family history of glaucoma that was mixed mechanism or the parents had surgery for glaucoma, easily that's an almost an automatic that you're going to want to do a test to show that it's on a plateau iris or that there's not some form of angular malformation. So. Right. And there's a couple more questions here just regarding the learning curve to becoming proficient at performing. You know what? That's a great question. Um, I started off with the device, and I was doing most of the testing because I wanted to become familiar with it. It took me probably about three or four attempts to learn how to make the coupling of the uh, ultra-thin uh, head uh, to the actual instrument itself. Once I got that, then it's just a matter of sort of the ergonomics of doing the test. There's actually a marker on the head that shows you the position. So you just put the marker up at 12, you're running at 12, you're up and down, and then you're horizontal, and then you flip it upside down, and you go the other way, and then finally you finish it off horizontally on the other side. Um, it took me, I'd say, a day or two. My technician, Josh, who's, who works with us and has also done some educational components with the device for doctors at various places, uh, it probably took him two days, maybe a day and a half, of using it with some regularity on you know colleagues in the office or students or tech or you know, my, my staff, and we practiced regularly. But once he got it, it was very intuitive. <clears throat> and now Josh, I, I was I was kidder Josh in a couple of days to be a very talented UBM person. And I think anybody's staff, who's, if you have staff that are doing any other type of testing, OCTs or any other any other device diagnostic systems, this is a natural for them because most of it is actually the computer itself, you know, plugging in the data, picking the program that you want, starting it on, and then getting the patient positioned. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a day or two at the most, and, you know, the company was very kind. They came in, gave us an excellent uh, hands-on demonstration, trained as many people as we wanted. Uh, my students come in, and they learn how to do it in a few hours, maybe, maybe a half a day. They'll do two or three, and they're ready to go. So I, I think the ease of use has really vaulted to a completely different plane than we had even just five years ago with any of the other systems. So. Great. 
Okay. I think that that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Timmons, for well, your time Thank you, and thank everybody today. for joining us, and enjoy the evening. And uh, hopefully your fall has been as lovely as ours in New England, and I hope it uh, just goes on until next spring. That would be a nice thing. So. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Great. Thank you. Bye.